Good evening, friends. Stephen Verdun here with Israeli News Live, and we have, as I promised you, a very special guest, Scott Sion, uh, uh, with uh, Planet uh, News, PlanetXNews.com, and I know I probably just mess that all, all up, Scott. PlanetXNews.org. Dot org. I knew, I knew, I knew I got that wrong in there somewhere. So, correction again: Planet News, Planet X. News <laughs> or dyslexia is working its best today with me. Uh, so anyway, Scott, we have spent a lot of time talking together uh, over this past weekend, and uh, I really appreciate a lot of the things that you've said and uh, to me about Planet X. And I wanted our viewers to be able to get a perspective from your thoughts. Uh, I did have another briefing. Well, I've actually had it with both sources, uh, the, uh, the FEMA engineer that I, guy I know there, as well as a uh, longtime friend with, uh, with the Pentagon. And one thing, my Pentagon source and you are, are, are far, or I would have to say are more on a very much the same page in the things that you've shared with me. Now, the FEMA engineer that I know, uh, there's still a lot of differences there. And... And my, my objective here today is I want to have people to have an objective opinion from both sides, not just one side of you. And that's why I reached out to you, especially after you showed the images that you were showing of Planet X around the sun. Now, in all fairness to my Pentagon source, he does disagree with that. Although you guys are on the same page on everything else, and I know you'll explain all that why, like somebody like himself would probably disagree with that. Uh, but he claims that Planet X is still out beyond Jupiter. That's his thought there. Now, one thing that he said to me, and I want to just bring this up before we get going to you, uh, is that the thing that is that we are dealing with now, he said it's because I, I, he'd never explained it in detail to me before. He just told me that uh, all the weather changes. He told me about we're going to see massive earthquakes, things like that. And he, had, he confirmed that what you told me as well about the corona ejection, the sun and the, the solar minimum, all that is so true. And uh, he said, the, like, because he had told me back in March, Nebraska, and the, that was only in an email. We, we didn't discuss, we had discussed it on the phone as well, but he told me that uh, we would see storms in the Midwest like that that would be record breakers, 100 plus miles an hour is actually how he stated that. And yesterday on the phone, he went deeper. He said, it's going to get worse. Uh, and you and him also on the same page too. He said 2023, 2024 is going to be the peak of this. And that's when it could be actually, as he put it, life altering uh, was his statement. But then he explained to me, though, I said, Steve, what I'm talking about, though, when we talk about asteroids, he said, I would agree more with Robert when you had him on about little small things here and there you'll start seeing, and it'll gradually build up over the next couple of years. He said, but this has nothing to do with Planet X. He said, uh, there is actually, he said, I'd have to call it like a cloud of debris that's coming up. And... This is going to be a shocker, and I haven't even shared this part here with you as of yet, Scott, but he said to me, he said, Steve, he said, we have interplanet vehicles that we can travel back and forth to other planets. That's the first time I've ever had a Pentagon source actually tell me that. And that yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've heard that for the last couple of years, that pretty much has to do with the Remember, I was telling you about the uh, the black ops NASA, and yes. then you're just your regular civilian NASA. Okay, yes, and that's exactly right. So we're going to have an exciting things. But he told me that this is when they discovered this. Uh, he said they were en route to another one of the planets, and they discovered this thing floating. And he said the only way to describe it is like a, he said actually space is not what people think. It's not a vacuum or a void. Uh, he said, I don't want you to think motor oil, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a fluid. It's something yeah, it's like fluid. It. Yeah. There we go. So good. You'll be able to help us on that as well. Uh, and so he said, that's what it is. And he said, we ran across this cloud on one of these trips here. So they knew about when it would be coming in. And he said, it's got all kinds of trash in it, is the way he described it. He said, but that has nothing to do with Planet X. It's something totally different. Well, that's Planet true. I mean, we've, we've been moving... Well, our, our little teeny tiny solar system 
in one spiral arm of our galaxy. I mean, it's just like walking down the city street in New York City. Each step you take, you're going to encounter something else. A multitude of people from different races and religions, consider them to be objects, planets, moons, stars, nebula. So everything in space is in constant motion. So our little solar system just doesn't sit there, even though it seems like we are just sitting there because of how massive the, the galaxy is, and then you have the universe. So a lot of people can't fathom those distances or those sizes, and I mean, I, mean, I can't either. So yeah, our solar system does move into different cloud, uh, different clouds in space that have different compositions, like helium, um, debris, whether it be big or small, and it will affect our solar system, and it could take hundreds of years to pass through it, or it can take a thousand years or thousands of years. It all depends on how big it is. But that's really getting deep into um, astrophysics and not really astronomy. Um, and it's really hard for, for people to understand it, especially if you don't have any kind of visuals, you know, like a, a digital model that you could show people and then help them understand if they're not, you know, astronomy buffs or earth space science. And then you kind of lose them or you may even become boring to them <laughs> if you're trying to explain it. Right. Now, let me ask you this here, Scott. Uh, we were talking a lot about uh, Planet X. And one of the things that, uh, that we, got to, we got into a discussion about was the memory stick that was given to me by, I, I have no idea who the guy was. He's an elderly gentleman. Uh, he seemed to be very, very intelligent as far as what he spoke about. Uh, but in our conversation, you were sharing that, that information with me. I actually give that to Paul Bagley, and I know he's kind of gone on with it uh, in, in every other different direction you could imagine. For me, it was, it was rocket science. I am no, and, I, and I've said that to people, I'm no uh, scientist, no, uh, you know, I don't, I don't understand any of those things. So for me, it was over my head. Uh, but you shared with me that you noticed right off when you were watching some of the things that uh, Paul was putting out that there was information on that memory stick that was directly from the work that your wife has done. And maybe it'd be a good idea to give a little background on your wife as well in, in, in her field so that people would understand this. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I had watched, uh, I believe I watched your video first. Uh, someone had emailed me a link to it and they had recognized some of the mathematical equations um, that were in, well, that were on that, uh, that memory stick. And so far, uh, me and my wife, she's a, she's a doctor and a retired professor of physics. Um, she has two master's degrees, three bachelor's degrees, and, um, she's a pretty much a math whiz. Um, you should see her thesis for, oh my God, it looks like hieroglyphics. Let's just put it that way. So I'm not a big math buff. But um, anyways, um, we've written 14 books together. And uh, I forget which book it was. Um, but she would, uh, she would place these mathematical equations and formulas into the book as she was trying to explain different things about these, these stellar cores. You know, a lot of people misconstrue these, these objects as planets, and they're, they're, they're not planets. What we presume them to be are dead stars or the core of a dead star. And that's something that we really haven't seen in astronomy. They could be similar to a brown dwarf, but not close. Similar, but not close. 
and we don't know exactly what they are. You know, we, we as common people haven't been able to actually get any kind of composition of it. However, you know, over the last couple of years, NASA's had this urge to send probes out to, quote, kiss the sun. Parker Space Probe, Solar Orbiter. We had the technology to do that 10 years ago. They never did. They're only doing it now because they need more information. The satellite space cameras that we have out there are old, 15, 20 years old. We have new technology uh, that is out there now, but we will never, ever see any of that data. Like all of the public data where I make my captures uh, from the stereo spacecraft and the solar dynamic spacecraft, um, and they play around with that too. You know, they they cut and delete information constantly. And over the years, <laughs> I've developed a way to, um, with some computer programs, peel back the layers of interference on these coronagraphs. And uh, believe it or not, it is software that uh, that police departments. Uh, law enforcement agencies use. They've, been, they've used it for years now, but it's getting better. So, for instance, if they get a video or a photograph that's kind of blurry, suspect, or they want to zoom in on a license plate number of a vehicle or blah, 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 whatever, um, this program was developed for law enforcement. I just happen to have a very good friend of mine who's a professional photographer, and his daughter a few years ago, she graduated from college and um, she started working for a law enforcement agency as a, uh, a criminal investigator, crime scene investigator and photographer. And she was trained on this software and it's pretty, it's pretty sophisticated. Um, it took her two years to learn it. And uh, I got to watch what I say here. Um, she's helped me out with being able to utilize uh, that software, not when she's working, but you know, let's just say I was able to get my hands on a, a, a portion of the software um, because there's, there's several phases of it um, that's, that you're able to use to get a clearer picture, clear up a video, stabilize a video. It's not your common everyday run-of-the-mill stuff that you can buy. It's, it's, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and it's only available to law enforcement agencies. So <clears throat> that has helped me over the last couple of years unmask and understand what is truly out there. And uh, getting back to the memory stick, when I saw your video, I showed it to, to my wife, and she, you know, she has her uh, YouTube channel, Dr. Claudia Elbers. Planet X physicist. And uh, she says, oh boy, she goes, uh, that's my, those are my formulas out of my book, out of our book. And I said, I thought I recognized those and uh, a lot of the information. And uh, I don't know, I think, I think Pastor Paul, I think he might have shown, I think he did show a few photographs that were uh, taken from the, the book. And, uh, you know, those photographs are available on my website, on my Facebook pages and things of that nature. And I've, I've look, I, I go through people snatching my work every single day. But um, when we watched your video, uh, and then I saw Pastor Paul come out with this whole conference and, you know, and, and charging people to come to this conference, he was going to reveal what was on that, uh, that memory stick. I said to myself, wow, you know, the majority of that's our information. Some of it was um, kind of mocked up a little bit to make it more flamboyant. Some of it was wrong, completely wrong. But I said to uh, Claudia, I said, wow, Pastor Paul's making a mint off of this, <laughs> you know? 
And I did send him an email, and uh, he never responded to it. Sent him another email. He never responded to it. Claudia sent him an email, and uh, re he never responded to that either. And, uh, you know, I just kind of let it go, you know. And then I think he – uh, I think he recorded it and put it on DVDs for sale and, and so on and so forth. But uh, there were, I, I don't know exactly all of the information that was on that, uh, that memory stick. I will send you what I'll do, Scott, is I'll, I, I've got it saved on one of my computers. So I did save it before I sent it out. I'll send it to you. Now, one thing that, uh, and I don't remember as far as the formulas, things like that, but I do know that on that memory stick, he did have a lot of stuff hyperlinked in there. Like if you clicked on it, it would take you to either whatever website it was from or stuff like that. But whether or not the math formulas are not are done that way, I, I don't recall. I, because I clicked on a few things just out of curiosity to see where he was getting it from. But I didn't remember if anything was sourced from you or not. Because I just, like I said, I just, I haven't had a chance to go back and look to see on that. Uh, but I'd like for you to be able to see what's on there so that you can see whether or not, you know, he did that or, or if he actually had credited your wife back for the work that she did, uh, because that's a big issue to me. I mean, if, you, if you're going to get information from somewhere, at least have the decency uh, to source where you got that from. Uh, and like you said, you know, then other people turn around and just make a lot of money on it. And, and I know Paul has always said that uh, this came from an astronomer, and I've made it quite clear to him. He never told me what he was. Uh, he never said he was an astronomer. I mean, the man was, he was elderly. He was like about 72 years old, and he was very brilliant. I mean, he spoke English like I don't understand. Alabama, we don't speak like that. So, <laughs> you know, but at, at any rate, what I would like to go into, though, is in the work that you and your wife have done, Scott, you guys, uh, you believe that Planet X has already come in and it's NASA's covering this up and it got caught in an orbit around the sun. Yeah, I think it's more of NASA's job to cover it up. I think it's more of mainstream science that is covering it up and also possibly some areas of deep state government just like ufos you know the president of the united states never knows anything about ufos but everybody in the air force and the navy and the naval astronomy uh, uh observatory well they they know it all so we do understand that our government and many other governments have their own alter form, uh, alternating form of a government known as a deep state, black ops, black budgets, things of that nature. So I, you know, because a lot of, a lot of things come from major universities and they end up in our government as far as technology and things of that nature. And in return, the universities were given substantial grants and endowments. And, uh, you know, I mean, Harvard University was just busted taking uh, endowments from China and sending Chinese students there to learn and then take everything back to China. So I think dissolving the mainstream science is a big big problem they don't want anybody to know that the possibilities of other objects entering into our little itty bitty tiny solar system and changing everything yeah it could start a panic but it would only start a panic if you panic the people and the way you tell them that you've made a new discovery. Nobody panics when we talk about comets passing through. Nobody you know, uh, uh, panics when we talk about asteroids passing through. So why would they panic if our solar system just got a little bigger? And, and that, that brings the question then, if, 
indeed Planet X is caught in an orbit, and some of the photographs that you have uh, published see, uh, certainly seem to uh, indicate that. I know you told me it was like it, it orbits the sun in 28 days. Yeah, we've we've narrowed it down. It took me about three years of noting down the uh, the photo captures in a calendar program in my computer, and then you know one day running uh you know running a little query and uh it came out to 28.5 days that it makes uh, a rotation in a very eccentric and elliptical orbit now i did create uh a digital uh video model of how this happens okay it's very very fast but it's not uncommon you know when I first divulged that information, people said that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. It's quite common. <laughs> I mean, we have stars that orbit each other. We have brown dwarf stars right outside of our solar system that orbit each other. I watched a Harvard University seminar with all astrophysicists and astronomers from Harvard talk about new discoveries of two brown dwarf stars outside of our solar system, just on the edge, that were orbiting each other. And uh, they were taking uh, photo plates of it using the, uh, the WISE observatory. Uh, they have to take just one photograph of space and it's it's in a negative and then they take another one and then another one and then they're able to plot and see if an object moves ever so slightly at that far distance well they found those two brown dwarfs orbiting each other very very tightly very very quickly and then six months later one broke off and went its own way so yes two stars can orbit each other Another large body with a very strong magnetic field can be captured by our sun with no problem. People don't understand how powerful the sun's magnetic field is. It reaches all the way to the end of our solar system. So if one of our planets in the inner solar system would stop moving like if the earth would stop moving and stop orbiting well, what do you think would happen to it it would eventually get sucked right into the sun it's the same reason why mercury is relatively close to the sun but not really it's it's tens of millions of miles away if mercury would stop orbiting the sun it would get sucked into the sun. The sun's uh, magnetic field and gravitational force would suck it right in. So that is the same with these, these objects. I, there is one of them, one main core that is very, very large. We estimated with all of the photographs um, that, you know, it, it, it's somewhere about four to five times the size of Jupiter. Pretty Closer to four times the size. You hear a lot of other so-called Planet X researchers, and I won't name any names, but they all say, oh, it's seven times the size of Jupiter. No, that would be, you know, I mean, it would be impossible, but it would be, uh, it would be much bigger in the photographs that I capture uh, every single month. So it's very hard to judge and calculate and estimate the size of these objects in these photographs because they're coming from coronagraphs. They're two-dimensional images. We have no way of gaining three-dimensional images. And the perception, it's just, it's very, very hard. Um, the main object is... Uh, pretty close to 200,000 miles in diameter. The sun is 865,000 miles in diameter. 
And uh, this object has a very strong magnetic field, um, strong enough where its, its magnetic field is, is reaching Earth, just the fringe of it. It's also having a field day with the sun also. So that's another area that you have to get into. You have to understand the sun's magnetic field, how it works, how the Earth's magnetic field works. And uh, there's quite a bit of studying. Look, look, I've been at this for 23 years now. So you just can't jump into it and say, okay, I'm good at math. I'm going to find planet X. It's not going to work. Oh, I'm an astronomer. I'm going to go find planet X. Well, you're not going to find it with a telescope. That's for damn sure. The sun is entirely too bright, even if you use H-alpha filters. This object does not give off light at all. So therefore, if you were flying through space and it was right in front of you, you wouldn't see it. You would smash right into it. So, I mean, again, it's very hard for people to, to, to understand and fathom all of this. If you've not been watching and listening to me for years as the information has progressed to the level of where it's at right now. Let me ask you this, uh, uh, Scott. The, what is the risk factor of this planet orbiting the sun right now? Uh, and indeed, Planet X is known to have a massive iron core already. And you're saying that it's, it's already interacting with the sun. And many people think about solar flares, how that affects the Earth as well. And, uh, and I guess we can just take it from right from there and go right into the solar minimum that we're dealing with. Uh, kind of give us some idea of that. What is the risk that we're facing here on Earth and what's it going to cause to the Earth? Well, the solar minimum, um, I, back in 2016 and, and 2017, I didn't even really think about what the solar minimum was going to uh, turn out to be in relation to this object orbiting the sun, meaning that Every 11 years, the sun goes through a cycle, a solar minimum and then a solar maximum, every 11 years. During the solar minimum, the activity on the sun, coronal mass ejections, filaments, uh, coronal prominences, explosions on the sun, the, the corona of the sun starts to shrink. It's referred to as the sun going to sleep. There is a considerable difference when you view the Solar Dynamics Observatory website where you can see the sun from a spacecraft in different extreme levels of ultraviolet light. Um, the Earth's magnetic field functions off of the sun's magnetic field. During a solar minimum, the sun's magnetic field weakens substantially. During that process, the Earth's magnetic field weakens. During that 11-year time span, during a solar minimum, as the Earth's magnetic field weakens, and we are now getting bombarded more and more and more by, let's just say, we'll just call it space radiation, solar radiation, but it's, um, it's a big mess of uh, photons, electrons, and protons. All of these heavily charged particles streaming from the sun, blasting the Earth. And us. <laughs> now, I monitor all of that on a daily basis, every single bit of it. I noticed that as we were dipping into this solar minimum, that, oh my, the Earth might have some problems. These heavily charged particles, whenever we get hit by a geomagnetic storm, uh, what's referred to as the solar wind, which just happened today. There was a coronal mass ejection produced by this, one of these main objects, because it literally, as it passes by so close to the sun, it literally pulls the plasma 
right from the corona, right off of the sun. And it causes a coronal mass ejection, a massive explosion. Now, the only areas where these coronal mass ejections have been occurring over all of these years is right around the equatorial region of the sun, the equator, the midpoint. Why? A coronal mass ejection should be able to explode and occur anywhere on the sun. But now, they're always coming from the eastern and western limb of the sun, okay? Okay. How is that possible? Well, if you look at the angle of this object as it comes up, and it loops around the sun and comes down, and it drops all the way below our ecliptic, below our solar system, and then it swung, or it's, it's swung back up. So where are the closest points when it's coming up? Its closest point is right near the sun's equator on the eastern limb. As it loops up over the sun and comes back down, where is its closest point to the sun on the western limb of the sun near the equator? And then it drops down. <clears throat> I think its speed also slows down somewhat. And then as it starts to come back up, it speeds up a little bit. It equals about 28 and a half days. But these coronal mass ejections, they're only occurring in these two areas. Now, I've been watching and monitoring the sun for years and years and years. That's just not a coincidence, what's happening with these coronal mass ejections. During a solar minimum, hell, you might maybe see a small one here, a small one there. But the coronal mass ejections have not stopped during the solar minimum. They've increased. The activity on the sun has not gone away. It's still there. And it's getting worse. Now, if the Earth is in a position to be hit by one of these coronal mass ejections, like what is going to happen on the 20th, um, those heavily charged particles make their way towards the Earth in about two to three days. They pass right through, right through the, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth. They penetrate and they make their way all the way through the mantle into the core. During those times, when we are in direct contact with that stream, where it hits the earth, that's where you're going to see major earthquakes or an influx of earthquake activity. So if we get pounded by this on the 20th of August, look for some bigger earthquakes, magnitude sixes, possibly even a seven, to occur sometime between maybe the late on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Now, I've been studying, you know, uh, volcanism, volcanoes, and earthquakes for years and years and years and years. I've stated numerous times over these years that the sun has an influence on our seismic activity on this planet. Mainstream science said that that is crap. That can't happen. Well, after all these years, and just this year, now they agree with me. And they've written several abstracts and published several papers on the subject and have taken pretty much all of the credit for that so-called scientific discovery. <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah, so what they did is they read your work and then they decided, okay, now we'll go ahead and admit to it, all right? Oh, this well, I mean, I beat it to death. You know, I beat it to death. I explained all of this, and, and so did my wife in a lot of her papers. She would write two or three scientific papers a day and then narrate them and show people on her YouTube channel. And um, <clears throat> we, we both agreed on this, and then... You know, we started figuring some things out 
that if the Earth's magnetic field is weakening because of this solar minimum, then that means the magnetic, uh, the magnetic field interaction from that object could possibly be reaching the Earth. Now, it's only 93 million miles away. In space, that's like five feet. So we're getting an influence from the sun's magnetic field and this object. Now, I've been complaining for the last several years and warning people about the North Pole, the Arctic melting. People called me a fool. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not happening. That's all a lie. Oh, oh, well, just last year, now they finally admit that it is happening and it is causing serious problems. It's one of the main problems with our weather right now. That ice cap melt is horrendous. It is so bad that in the summertime, like now, you can sail a ship straight across the Arctic, up through the Atlantic, across the Arctic, and out into the Pacific. No problem. You know, it's interesting you say this, because I did a, a broadcast a little while back, and I, was, I did this on Russia, and Russia was uh, fighting for dominance over yep. the northern, as he called it, quote-unquote, northern sea route. Exactly. And I remember that. It's all solid ice, right? And But I said, look, if Russia is arguing over a northern sea route, they know that that is melting. Or, and my thought was uh, the Earth moving off of its axis uh, originally was my thought because my thought was, okay, Planet X would cause that or whatever. But we already know the poles have been shifting for some time. But now speaking, though, also going back to this thing on the planet, uh, the, the Planet X and its effects here, and these mass corona ejections, uh, what is the government's fear that they have that they would not want to make this public in the first place? I mean, I know you, you alluded to the idea that, okay, it might cause people to panic, but at the same time, you know that it has a massive iron ore core, and that's why it has such a tremendous uh, uh, gravity pull but, and then you also mentioned too though, Scott, you talked about these two dwarf stars that were orbiting one another, then suddenly one decided to break off. Are they concerned maybe that this thing could break off? I mean. Well, those were two brown dwarfs and um, the, the gravity of the sun is totally different than, than a brown dwarf. Um, the situation that we're in right now, as far as I am concerned, and as far as I know, scientifically, um, these objects are kind of here to stay. Um, not in my lifetime or your lifetime or possibly even 10 more lifetimes will we truly see uh, the effects of you know, what, what is going to happen with the earth. I'm not trying to be a fear monger here. I'm just trying to give you the, the, the science behind it because it's pretty clear. Um, none of these objects are ever going to break away at this point in time. Mars, or excuse me, uh, Mercury has never broken away from the sun's gravity. Venus the Earth, Mars, not even Jupiter. So that shows you how strong and powerful the sun is. So I don't think that government agencies around the world, including China, Russia, the UK, Australia, the United States, Canada, uh, France, um, and definitely the Vatican, I don't think that they fully understand what they're viewing because they're, they're viewing it. Uh, they're tracking it 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they have been for probably quite a long time. Um, the first bit of video that I got was leaked to me from a New York Times reporter and it was leaked to her from 2007. And it was viewed on the Stereo B spacecraft that monitors the sun. There's two of them, Stereo A, right. which is to the left of the sun, and Stereo B was to the right, or right. to the right of the Earth. And they're in a geosynchronous uh, orbit with the Earth. Uh, this video snippet was leaked to her and explained to her, and uh, I guess they wanted her to leak the information. And um, before she could really even leak the information, somehow, some way, um, it was found out that she had this video clip from the Stereo B spacecraft, and uh, she was paid a visit. Um, straight, walked straight into her Manhattan uh, apartment building, which if anybody's familiar with Manhattan, you just don't walk in an apartment building. You're going to go through security. Uh, they're going to make a phone call up to your apartment door or your, your apartment, and then you'll be let in. Well, these two individuals knocked on her door straight up. And then, you know, they told her that, that what she was about to do would be the end of her career. And, and, you know, possibly uh, a crime. I don't know what kind of crime. It's a discovery in space, for God's sakes. And that, but, that's what blows me away, Scott. Uh, yeah. And you shared that information with me. And th you, it doesn't make sense why there's such a fear. Now, of course, now there is one other thing that I wonder about, and that is the corona ejections. When we have this... I don't know if I'm saying the right word, plasma that suddenly explodes because as you're mentioning, this, it goes around in this orbit. Now, let me ask you this, because I've, I've heard they've talked about before, they say like, okay, when the Bible talks about the, the moon turned to blood, uh, all right, there's been an argument by some uh, scientists that that was actually caused by a mass of ejection that when it hit the moon, it, because of whatever it is that's, that comes from the sun there, and I don't know the right terminology for this, it has uh, like this iridescent look, and it made it look as if it was red, and then that was one of the reasons, and they say when they went to the moon, they discovered that type of scenario there. So is that something that, and, and I'm just hypothetically saying this because I don't understand it, can we get with our orbit around the sun with this timing also of this planet going around the sun as well now, and causing these massive uh, uh, ejections, could it possibly so, uh, coincide to where the next thing you know, is this going around, we're coming around, we get in the right place, wrong time, and we get one of these ejections and it hits the earth directly. Yeah, we're having that, uh, it just happened uh, yesterday and we're gonna get hit with it on the 20th. Um, I mean, I just, uh, I just uploaded a video on it on my YouTube channel um, oh, just a few hours ago. Okay. And uh, you know, it, it's uh, it gives you gives you the timing, uh, the estimated time. Um, these spacecraft monitor these things uh, coming from the sun twenty four seven. They're able to estimate the speed, um, and we're talking, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles per second. Sometimes even a million. Sometimes even two million miles. Uh, when you get into the solar wind. Um, this one is going to reach us, the fringe of it, on the 20th. And it will probably take about 24 hours for us to, or for it to pass right through the earth. And like I said, you'll probably see a, a, a pretty big increase in some volcanic activity as well as earthquake activity for about two or three days. Now, we may catch a few magnitude sixes, and you may see some uh, volcanoes get really, really, really um, active. Those are some of the biggest problems that were ever going to occur on this planet dealing with what's out there. 
so far. Now, that's just with the solar minimum. Look what's happening now with just a solar minimum. Now, because I truly believe that these, this is a small system of some kind. There's more than one object. There's uh, several. One of them is quite large, very large. Um, I mentioned back in January that going into June, July, August, and September, that, that four-month period, because of the orbit of this object and the orbit of Earth in our 12-month cycle, during that four-month period, we're probably going to get some of the most spectacular shots of this system. And I was right. Because starting off in June, we started getting spectacular views. Same thing with July. And now for the first time, I've photographed what looks like a cluster. Not once, not twice, but three times. June, July, and now in August. So that's not a coincidence at all. And uh, when we move, well, we're already moving into a solar maximum right now. So we've already hit the peak in the solar minimum and we're coming down into the solar maximum. Well, the sun is reacting to that earlier than I thought. <clears throat> so as we progress further into the solar maximum, you're going to see a lot of sunspots just above and just below the sun's equator. These sunspots have the ability to explode, explode into massive plasma disbursements, filament disbursements, coronal mass ejections. What that could do to the Earth at this point in time in our modern day is destroy our electrical infrastructure. That's pretty critical. Because if you've ever researched the Carrington event, what happened back in, I think, like the 1850s, the Earth was hit by one of these massive coronal mass ejections. And it burned up all of the telegraph wires. It caused a massive earthquake in the New Madrid Fault that spewed the inner earth out of the cracks for a month. A lake in, I forget which state, along the New Madrid Fault, the lake disappeared, and it's still gone to this day. I've been there before. Yeah, so in our modern day, as you know, everything's electronic. If we were to get hit with a modern-day Carrington event right now, portions of the Earth's electrical grid would be completely destroyed, and it would probably take somewhere in the neighborhood of about a decade to repair. So you can see what that would do to humanity. Look what's happening on the streets now. Just think what it would be like with no lights. Scott, in, in closing, uh, and of course, as we close out, I've got one more question I want to ask you about, uh, and then uh, have you share with everyone, again, your website, your, 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 yours and your wife's YouTube channel, and I'll post links for the people, uh, and also how they can order the books that you and your wife have written. Uh, but one thing that I saw that you and uh, my Pentagon source really were even in timing, you guys were pretty accurate, the same on this, is we're going to see a lot of major weather events. And uh, he was saying that, of course, and he talked about the solar minimum, solar maximum causing this, but he also, as he, he said to me yesterday, on June 15th, we entered into the Earth, because like you said, he said it goes like a corkscrew going yeah. through the universe. 
and he said, we entered into this uh, cloud of debris. He said that will begin to affect us as well. But, but he talked about more about these major weather changes. He had told me, like I said, 100 plus mile an hour winds. He said that Florida will see hurricanes like never, we, record breaking type hurricanes. Uh, he talked about earthquakes volcanoes, etc. And he also mentioned to me the peak of this really would be 2023, 2024. Uh, and also to and I, throwing this one at you as well. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about that comment that the uh, you were going to look into it. Uh, the asteroid. Yeah, asteroid for uh, September 1st. I know the one they're talking about on November 2nd, even though it probably would hit it so small, probably burn up before it comes down anyway. But the other one, I asked uh, my Pentagon guy about the one for September 1st. He said there's a good possibility, he said, if it pulls in, uh, that we might see like what happened in Russia. He said that one really caught everybody off guard because it came up from underneath and no one was really expecting it. He said, but we might get another show like that one, he said, if it gets close enough. And so... I know you were going to look into that, and I want to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean, no, um, I mean that one is going to be coming very close. Uh, when when they start measuring them in lunar distances, and um, they are the the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the JPL monitors the near Earth objects twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. The issue with the uh, asteroid that struck in Chelyabinsk, Russia, um, they were monitoring another very large meteor and then out of nowhere coming from the direction of the sun that's why they weren't able to see the Chelyabinsk meteor because basically they were blinded by the light <laughs> and that asteroid came in so fast it was completely undetected and they were watching another meteor now People may believe me, they may not believe me, but when they do get a bead on a space rock that's going to get a little too close, they will continue to watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it. If they feel that its trajectory has changed in a derogatory way, like it's going to hit the earth. The chances of that happening with a small space rock are kind of slim to none. If you remember the Star Wars program from the Ronald Reagan era and what we have up there now orbiting our earth, they'll blast it. They'll destroy it before it gets anywhere near Earth's atmosphere. Now, that's risky also because that can cause smaller fragments to, you know, come in. We have seen a, a pretty big increase in near-Earth objects since 2015, and it's steadily going up. So they've got to be coming from somewhere on this, this volume, okay? I mean, let's just think about it. Ten years ago, it wasn't like this. If you look at the scale on a bar graph that the JPL put out, I had it. Um, I, I could go back and find it and, and, and send it to you. You could see the escalation in the bar graph according to the years. Boom, 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 boom. And up to 2016, oh, my God, we're looking at over 15,000 a year. 17, 18, 20,000. That's incredible. That has to be coming from somewhere. Something has to be influencing these rocks because they're mainly made up of nickel, magnesium, iron, and rock. So if another magnetic field was having an influence on perturbing their orbits, if you knock them out of their orbit, you may be knocking them into another orbital plane that may be coming very close to Earth. And what have we seen? That's what we've seen. So as we say, the science is still kind of out on that. 
if they did feel that, you know, uh, a, a, a small size meteor that could make it through the Earth's atmosphere, they are able to project exactly where it's going to hit. Just like in Russia, there's a little bit of evidence out there that, that Russia did use a missile to explode that meteor over Chelyabinsk. It's kind of blurry and unclear, and it exploded uh, 15,000 feet above the, uh, the Earth's surface. And uh, the damage was caused by the percussion. It did a lot of damage. It damaged 1,500 buildings and hurt 1,000 people. So if we were ever faced with that type of a situation, I, I, I do think that um, China, Russia, or the United States hopefully have something out there that could take care of it. But then again, they might not be that good of a shot. <laughs> you never know. That's true. Very true. And you know they're never going to really tell us. No, they're what not. They have. No, they're not. So what about the weather issues? The weather issues, I mean, that's been that's been changing drastically. And that is due to our our North Pole, our Arctic region, all of that melt, all of that fresh water flowing into the Pacific, flowing into the Atlantic. Uh, you know, years ago, the, uh, the, the Atlantic Beltway current, well, that's basically been changed and almost completely stopped. The way the jet stream patterns have been flowing, and I monitor all of those also, there's no longer just one jet stream in the northern hemisphere and one jet stream in the southern hemisphere. There's multiple jet streams, and they are absolutely just erratic the way things are happening now is we're getting these huge troughs that are being pushed down that's a huge trough of cold colder air and then we have the jet stream pulling upwards warmer air from the south pacific right across mexico and they kind of collide right over the midwest now remember last year when we had that that storm, that snowstorm that looked and resembled a hurricane coming right up yes. through the center part of the United States and up into Canada. If you looked at it and you watched it on the GOES satellites, it was a polar hurricane almost half the size of the United States. The barometric or the pressure in the center of the eye of the storm was that of a hurricane. It buried the whole middle part of the United States and then moved up into Canada. The same thing ap applies with our spring weather and our summer weather. We have a, a hurricane now, I think it's Genevieve, that is in the South Pacific. It's going to be making its way right up. And it may, in the next few days, smash directly into Baja, California as a hurricane. Very weird spots for hurricanes to come from in the South Pacific. Yes. Things have changed. Getting back to weather. We're breaking records every single year. Every single year. Today, the hottest temperature in the uh, Death Valley ever recorded, 130 degrees. Wow. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember back in uh, speaking about uh, Baja, boy, I was just a kid at the time, but they had two tropical storms that came up through there. They were actually, I think one was a hurricane, but it downgraded by the time it reached California there. And uh, it created a wall of water. Uh, I was up living in the mountains with my grandparents there, and it came down. I want to say it's like eight foot wall of water. Uh, unbelievable the damage that it did just because yeah. they're not used to the rain yeah you're gonna see you're gonna see more and more of these catastrophic rains and floods um not all over the world 
but in, in certain areas of the world, you're going to see this. Um, the way that we're situated here in the United States, we're going to see some areas, like say, for instance, in the winter, you're going to see some areas of the United States that are just going to get pounded to hell with Arctic temperatures and tons and tons and tons and tons of snow. And then you're going to see other areas of the United States, like the East Coast, that the temperatures in the dead of winter are going to be moderate, a little wet, but hardly any snow. I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, okay? The last five winters have been nothing. For the last three Christmases, the day after Christmas, 2017, 18, and 19, the day after Christmas, it's been in the low 60s. That just doesn't happen in Pennsylvania. Exactly. But that trough, that big horseshoe-shaped trough starts to jet upwards in the jet stream right over Ohio. And it splits Ohio right down the middle. So everything east of Columbus is just like my weather. Everything west of Columbus is under snow and freezing cold. Now, you know, we have so much to talk about it would take us months to get through all of this. But as we, as we go along, you know, you let me know. I'll, I'll come on any time, and we'll talk about some of these events that, that are occurring. You're going to see parts of the world that are going to go through extreme drought, but then you're going to see other parts of the world that are going to have extreme flooding. There's not going to be a medium in these places. They're just going to get hammered. Look at all the flooding in Germany last year, all the flooding in the UK, all the flooding in France, all of the flooding in Spain, and then in the Asian, uh, in Indonesia. Oh, my. Wow. Unbelievable. And India also. So you're going to have areas of the world that are going to have massive extreme heat, like India and some parts of the Middle East, 124 degrees. I predicted this year that Australia, well, actually the last two years in a row, that Australia is just like these poor people. They're getting blasted with extreme temperatures in their wintertime and extreme heat in their summertime. So much so that roads are melting. That's how extreme the heat is. And they've just been going up and down and up and down and up and down. And nobody really knew that there were ski resorts in a small part of Australia. Well, they've had record-breaking snow like they've never seen before. And um, you seem to be a pretty good expert on the Middle East. When was the last time you saw Arabs sled riding on snow on the sand dunes? You don't. Well, it's happened the last two years in a row. Yeah. And you normally don't. I mean, it is so rare to yeah. see snow. I mean, normally Mount Hermon is the one that has the snow. And, and <laughs> other than that, you just don't see it unless you're up in Iran or someplace like that. Yeah. These yeah. Were, this was in the desert. I thought, it, like, two years ago, I thought it was a joke. Till it was on the Weather Channel. And they were showing the same clip that I saw on Twitter. And I'm like, no, come on now. Those guys, those Arabs with their little their little head thing, uh, scarf going in, in the wind. And I, I forget what they were sled riding on, um, plastic, pieces of plastic uh, sheeting. And they were scooting. <laughs> but, yeah, things are going to be changing. And we're all going to have to accept it. You know, the earth is uh, it's not a perfect place. It never has been. And, uh, like, I consider it, like, you know, a, a living, breathing creature in space. It's going to go through changes. We should uh, try to just understand the changes and accept the changes and try to live through them. There you, you go. Know? 
Scott, we appreciate you coming on and giving the perspective from uh, the research that you've been doing, you and your wife. Uh, if you can share again with the people your website and the uh, YouTube channels for people to be able yeah, to. Yeah, uh, my website's planetxnews.org, uh, O R G. You can find Planet X News on Facebook and you can find Planet X News on YouTube. And uh, all of the links for my books, uh, me and Dr. Elvers, our books. Uh, I also have a private network, uh, which helps with, uh, you know, YouTube and Facebook censoring me because, uh, you know, you know, as well as I do, Steve, they love doing that. Oh, yes. But uh, everything is in the description box under any of my videos. Uh, all of the information's there. If you just catch one of the videos, make sure you see my face within the live streams. Um, some channels like the copy my material but um if you just go to youtube's search engine type in planet x news and you'll see my red black and yellow uh logo just click on it you could subscribe and uh, if you want to follow me on facebook or you know anything like that you can you can join in and um you know i show all of the evidence like i did today um just absolutely incredible and i find it not so scary when you educate yourself on the subject matter and uh, you turn that knowledge into power and then it's no longer fear mongering you're educating yourself you know i mean that's what i'm here to do and i know i've watched a lot of steve's videos that's what he's there to do he's there to educate all of you and report his findings so i guess we're just kind of like the messengers there you go. Hey, Scott, I really appreciate it. Again, friends, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, Scott Sion with Planet, uh, planetxnews.org. Thank you for watching, and we'll hope to have Scott back on before long. Sounds good. Take care, folks. Be safe. Let me hit the stop recording button, Scott.